This is Anita Edge interviewing Byron Walker. This is the second video, and he'll be explaining his strategy for maximizing profits. So, let me ask you, how important do you think it is that you have some connection or interest in the product you're marketing? <laughs> oh, good question. Um, I, I definitely break the mold in many ways, uh, and that's one of them. Um, I just don't think you need to have uh, a deep passion for a product to be able to market it. I am passionate about marketing. Mm. Okay, um, I don't necessarily have to be passionate about the products that we're marketing. Um, that being said, there's a couple of benefits in that. One is you almost have the same glasses as your customers do. Okay, because if you knew, if I knew everything there was to know about solar DIY products or solar green or whatever it may be, then I'm not able to have the same vision as my customers may. Okay, and so it kind of helps me not being the expert. Um, and and keep this in mind too. Most of most buyers, at least for us, and this is true across many fields, the the most most of the buyers that come to you are beginning something. Mm. Okay. Usually the, the true, true experts, they don't buy anything online. They can go find it for free or they have friends or something like that. It's the newbies that will buy your product. And so they're looking at this with new eyes and they've never, they don't know anything about it. And if you're in that same boat, kind of helps. Okay. Uh, but again, that being said, I don't think you need to have a deep passion for a product field to promote it. Okay. Um, that being said, once you start getting into it, the passion grows on you. Okay, mm. <laughs> uh, now I'm, I'm definitely green. I have solar panels. I, you know, I, um, I follow that uh, mantra, but I didn't at the beginning. It kind of happens through osmosis, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sounds <laughs> so like I don't think that's a critical part. And here's the problem: most people think, okay, I'm going to go be a business owner. <laughs> what am I the most passionate about? Well, I'm the most passionate about, you know, whatever. And then they go after that, and they don't analyze the, the market, okay? So let's say they're most passionate about um, dog training, okay? And, and so that's the one they go after. They just decide that I'm passionate about that, so that's the one I'm going to go after. They don't look at other dog training websites. They don't analyze the competition. They don't analyze if other people are making money in that niche. They don't analyze how much traffic or advertising is available to them. They don't look at any of the most basic fundamental things within a business. They just go after it because it's what they're passionate about. Right. It's I suggest you do it the opposite. First, examine that niche. Examine how much traffic it's getting. Examine the competition. Are there other people already making a lot of money in that niche? Okay. If not, I would go away. I wouldn't go into that niche. You don't need to be the first successful person in that niche. It's just that there's no reward at the end if you're the first to the market. So I highly recommend first examine uh, the niche and decide, is this a profitable niche that I can go into? And then at that point, then you can decide if you like it or if it's, you know, if it's a passion for you. But start with the market, not with your passion. Sounds uh, like those are the key factors to success here, right? Well, I, you know, I guess, so. Uh, you know, for me, one of the things that really helped me in my business was just taking massive action on the most important things. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, it's not just taking massive action. It's taking massive action on the most important things. Mm. Many people who start up a business, what's the first thing they do? Go get business cards. You don't need business cards. You just wasted an hour of your time trying to figure out how to get the layout right and the name and the phone number and getting printing. You know, you don't need that. Or getting a blog started. Um, or here's something. A lot of people, they decide they're going to create a product and market it. The first thing they do is make the perfect product. <laughs> and I dare to say that they're doing it wrong. The first thing you want to do is create the perfect marketing product for whatever you're selling okay and and it's it's an old adage but it's very true and that is when because like when we create a new product now in one of the niches we're going into the first thing we do well i shouldn't say that after we've determined through competitive analysis and traffic numbers and we know it's a good niche okay after all that the first thing we do we write the sales page first mm. and then we create the content 
Now, that's totally backwards of what a lot of people think. A lot of people, especially when they're passionate about something, they'll spend a year writing the 200-page PDF guide on their topic and make it just perfect. And it's the best thing out there. It's hands down just superior. But then they go try to figure out the marketing side and writing the sales page. And it should be the opposite. So we write the sales page first. And we make all the promises we want to make. And we determine that, yes, this will make the sale. Um, and then we fulfill those promises we made on the sales page in our content. And if we promise something on the sales page that we just can't fulfill on the content in the back end, then we go back to the sales page and change it. Okay, right. but we 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 start with the sales page, and that's the most important thing. So we take massive action on the most important things, and um, I think that's the key. You know, uh, a lot of people just never take those first steps, um, and when they are taking the first steps, maybe they're not looking at the most important things. Okay, so have you ever gotten in trouble where you you've the perfect sales page, you're starting to sell, and you can't produce what you promised? Well, we, we would create the product, the con, you know, in this case, an ebook. We'd create the product before we ever started marketing, mm -hmm. right? But we would start writing the sales page, and we would figure out how we're going to market it before we write the um, PDF guide, okay? But before we actually started the first marketing campaign, no, we would, the, the content's done, okay. okay? So when we make the sale, we we're able to deliver it. But I will say this, when we launch a new product, the back-end content is good. Maybe not great. It's good. The, the marketing and the sales side is great. And that's where all of our really hard work and detail and effort goes into. And then, once we have a successful product, because not every product we've launched has been successful. Some of them just die right there. Ah. But if it's successful and we're making money, and we know that within the first month, then bam, we'd go straight back to the content and make the content the best there is out there. Okay, so as soon as we see successful, you know, we're climbing and we're making sales and it's profitable, then we go back to the content and make the content great. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is, you know, what makes something so great that no one's ever going to see? Because maybe the product flops and it, you just can't market it. There's no market for it. Whatever. Well, you just spent most of your time on the content, and no one will ever see that great content because you weren't able to market it right. Right. So the second point in that is you don't know what the content should be anyways until you get deeper into that niche, and you start talking to your customers, and you get feedback from your customers, and you do surveys to those who bought your product. That's when you really understand what your back-end content, the PDF you know, ebook that you write, that's when you realize what it really should contain. Okay? You're not smart enough to figure it out, believe me. No one is. <laughs> I'm not. Okay? Only our customers can tell us what they really, really want. And of course we give all of the people who bought previously, we give them free upgrades to the, you know, the better content uh, when it's done. Ah, that makes sense. That that makes a lot of sense. That way your reputation is good. <laughs> oh yeah. No, they they love us. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I mean, you know, some some people might hear this and say, "Ooh, that's kind of I don't know, I don't know if it's scammy." Just some people might hear that and say, "Well, you're not per you're not giving a good product." Well, we are giving a good product. It's just not great. And some people who are passionate about their niche feel that they can't launch a product and sell it unless it is the best possible thing out there. Okay, and I dare to say that's the wrong direction. Right. You know, make it great only after you've got enough people interested in buying it. <laughs> Very practical advice. Yeah. So let me ask you, what personal qualities of yours do you think played a key role in your success? Um, well, you know, I did have some background in sales and marketing, so obviously that helps. I, I had no background in online internet marketing, or at least not the, the type that we were doing, but I had the basics. Um, I also had, you know, run a business before this and anytime you run a business for the first time, there's a learning curve. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I had at least to some degree, some of that, you know, running a business experience out of the way. So that helped. Um, but again, it comes back to just taking massive action. Mm -hmm. well, um, I'm just, 
throughout my entire life, that's one thing that I've always done is just when, when I determined I'm going to go into something, just take massive action. And again, it's not even the number of hours. It's the action. Because I know a lot of people who try to make internet marketing work, and they're very, very busy. But they're busy on the things that aren't the most important things that they could be doing. Okay, so I'm getting that not only are you very active, but you're very focused and able to fo able to tell what matters and what doesn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, business cards might not be the best example because this is online marketing, mm -hmm. but it, think about it. How many businesses start off with the first thing they do is the business card, and that's not important. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and especially when you're new, you could spend half a day on a business card. Right. How about you spend half a day on reading how to write the best sales page? Yep. That's more important. Yeah. Now, you mentioned earlier that you knew pretty pretty quickly that you wanted to transition from being just an affiliate to also being the merchant. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us how you made that decision. Well, you pretty much covered how you made the decision. How was the transition? Um, you know, it, it was good. I mean, it, it, like anything, it's, you know, growing pains within a business. Um, but, you know, it, it wasn't that difficult, and here's the reason why. My product wasn't the best product when I launched. It was probably the second or third best product, okay? But I launched, and I got it done. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and that's the most important thing. And then as soon as we had success, bam, we, I, I threw a ton of money back into actually making videos and rewriting the guide and hiring the best uh, solar DIY experts out there and you know I went back and made the product better but again the most important thing was is I launched okay and in fact when I launched green DIY energy to start with um, the product the backing content was made up of a lot of PLR which is private label rights okay so I had actually taken other people's guides worked out an agreement with them think of it this way instead of me spending six months learning all about solar DIY and then writing the guide myself and you know coming up with pictures and all that what I did was I I went to my competition okay and people who weren't my competition but had good content and I I told them listen I will make you a deal let me use your content which is written or videos and I will give you X dollars per sale that I create so when I first launched the product I wasn't that profitable because most of my profits went back to the people who gave me that content. But it doesn't matter. I launched. I got the product out the door. Once I start seeing sales, and I wasn't profitable, but once I start seeing sales, then I was able to go back and then create the content originally and spend more money on you know, doing the video in my backyard and, and all of those things. So, um, again, getting the product out the door, taking massive action to launch, and then making it better later. That's that's an important step. You don't have to make everything perfect when you first start. Yeah. So uh, you've gone into other niches. You talked about your solar niche. Uh, I assume you're always researching new niches. You're you're always looking for additional profitable areas. Um. Yes and no. You know, it comes back to the thought of scaling one product or one niche. Mm -hmm. And so we've. We've been tempted many times, but um, really we've been good about sticking with our original niches. So green and solar, that was uh, a niche. And I think we launched like six or seven products in that particular uh, niche um, and ignored all the other niches. So we got really good. We we're by far the best in that niche. Knowing we had the top sales, the top conversions, the top customer support, everything. We were the best of the best. But then we did look beyond green, but it was with very cautious eyes. But we did launch outside a new niche, and that was survival. Mm -hmm. So this is survivalist techniques, how to survive a hurricane, tornado, riots, whatever it may be. Um, and, and that was our second niche. But we didn't just, on a whim, go into it. Okay? We decided that, okay, you know, this is what we need to do. Uh, this is these are the resources we need, and so it wasn't just on a whim. It was a very calculated move. And believe me, we have you know opportunities thrown at us constantly that we have to say no to. So don't just go into a new niche um, unless it really makes sense. And try to pick a sister 
niche. <laughs> okay, a related niche in some kind. Okay. Yeah. Now, how is grain and survivalists related? They actually are, um, meaning survivalists is very off-grid, independent um, type mentality. So they are somewhat sister niches. Okay. And so then we went to survivalist, and I think we're up to f six products. We're launching a new product today, actually. So I think that'll be number six in that niche. Mm -hmm. um, and and now only because of our size, and we have you know fourteen people are working with us, and we have you know the strength and ability to do this. Now we are going into two new niches. But again, it, it's not on a whim. It's it, it's only after a lot of consideration because when you go into a new niche and you're going away from your primary niche, it's almost like having two businesses because now you have to have two sets of writers. You have to have two sets of people who do sales pages. You have to. It really adds a lot of complex. It, it makes your business much more complex uh, when you're going into a new niche. So make sure you're doing it only when you can do it. Don't, you know, we can do it now because we're big enough, we can handle it, but don't be jumping around different niches all the time. You want to stick with one and scale it up and only go to the next niche after you've scaled it up to, you know, 80% of its potential. Okay, makes sense. So when you do go into a new niche, do you always start as an affiliate before you create your own products? Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And um, well, it depends on the niche, but you may also have a database of people that you can test things to so but yeah before we go into a niche we are always we always do it as an affiliate um, one of the things you know you had asked what are some of the key factors to this, to our success well one of them is definitely that we follow the top competition mm -hmm. critical I would never go into a niche that I couldn't see that someone else was already making a lot of money in it okay um, now, how do you know that? Maybe you talk to the people and you know that, hey, they're, they're killing it. They're doing great. Or maybe you can, and here's how, this is the best way you can tell. Go, you know, get their URL to their top website and put it in Compete or go to Alexa or something like that and look how much traffic they're getting. If they're consistently getting a lot of traffic, they're making a lot of money because traffic is not free. Even if you're doing SEO or something, it's still not free. It takes a lot of time. So the only reason someone is make, getting a lot of traffic to their website is because they're spending a lot of time and effort into it. Now, why would someone spend a lot of money and a lot of effort into a product month after month after month, let's say six months in a row, without them making money? The more traffic they have, the more money they're making. Okay, so it's kind of the acid test. So we really analyze... Uh, the competition big time. I mean, we, if someone's not making money or getting a lot of traffic, I want nothing to do with that niche. Uh, there's no trophy when you get to the end and you were the first to create the products in that niche. There, it's just Being number two is the best place you can possibly be. Being number one is the hardest, the most expensive, the most time-consuming place. Um, and, and I know because now we're large enough that we do go into niches and we are the number one. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll split test five different ideas and come up with the best of the best ideas. And then the number two guys behind us will just take that, those results because they see what we're doing and they'll do it. So we just, we just basically, you know, something that took us six months, someone can come in right behind us and copy it uh, or take the idea and they've only spent a week doing it. Being number two is the sweet spot. Interesting. You know, I remember a gem of wisdom from you a few years ago. You said people kept coming up to you saying, I found a gold mine, I, I can solve this problem, and nobody's doing it. <laughs> yeah, I still have friends that come up and say, yeah, basically the same thing. This idea is going to change the world. It's amazing. It's amazing. and we, You should help me do it. And my first question is, is, you know, what else is already out there and how are they doing? Oh, no, that's the best part. No one's doing this. And it's just like right there, bam, shut the door. It's like <laughs> I have nothing to do with being the first to market. It's the hardest place to be and you just don't want to do it. And especially at the beginning. Again, we've been doing this about three years, so now I have enough confidence and knowledge and, and funding. I can go into a new niche and I can be the first one to ever create a product. But that's now. 
don't do it when you're brand new and you don't have any idea what you're doing. Take the easiest road to get there. Don't take the hardest, most untraveled road. It's crazy. And yet that's how most people do it. 